Well, it's President's Day. You know, I could preach a sermon and probably preach all the doctrines of the Christian faith just through the words of presidents, which I'm not going to do today. I would have been like a Geico camel on hump day if I had done that, so I didn't want to do that. But I want to stay faithful to the book of Romans. We've been reading the book of Romans. Could you imagine when that book of Romans, this magnum opus of Paul, came to the little church of Rome? He hadn't been there yet before, but he knew most of the people who had founded that church in Rome. They would get his book, and they would their, their church service would consist of opening up that book of Romans, that letter they'd been waiting for, and they would just read it word for word all the way through. So that's what we're going to do today for the second chapter. But I am a little worried that I'm going to be reading so much out of the second chapter, I'm going to read the whole second chapter. That's what I'm trying to say. And uh, so um, that makes me a little bit anxious, but I'm glad that we've got all our scholarly folks here for, for such an uh, endeavor. So let's go ahead. We'll open, the, open this sermon with a prayer. Father, we do pray that your Holy Spirit would speak life into this sermon, Lord. There's going to be a lot of reading in the sermon today, more than usual. And I pray that you would help us to stay focused, Lord. Help my comments to be pertinent and from you. And we ask that you would speak to us these lessons, Lord, and the implications, not just for us, but for the whole world of these words that, that you inspired Paul to write and you preserve so that we can read them today, Lord. What a blessing. So let us be blessed. Let your Holy Spirit speak to us. Let our hearts be pliable and our hearts be open to what you would do for us and in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, you might remember last week we were talking about Romans 1. And in that, Paul said, look, uh, everybody knows that there's a God, but some people suppress the truth of that God so they don't have to abide by his rules. And God judges those people by letting them live without his rules. And it's terrible. Nobody wants to live like that. But this second chapter of Romans, he's going to talk about those who accept God and his rules but fail to live by them perfectly, as our Father in heaven is perfect. So the sermon title today is Woe to Self-Righteous Do-Gooders. And this might get a little warm in here because he's preaching close to the core here, gets to the quick. Before we look at the words of Paul, I want to look at the words of Jesus because I think it helps explain some of this. And Jesus in Luke says, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. And you can almost hear people in the crowd say, boo, tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself, God I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. Now, if you remember from last week when we were talking about people that live unrighteously, that's kind of the crowd he's talking about. He's saying, Lord, thank you that you didn't make me like those people that don't know your law or don't want your law or reject your law. Now, when Jesus speaks, he's so clear and when he tells the story, I just know at this point, I do not want to be that guy. Like I, and if you've been a Christian for a long enough time, I've been a Christian a pretty long time, I've been that guy, right? And so I don't want to be that guy. But look, there's another guy. But he goes on to say, uh, thank you that you didn't make me like those people. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes on all that I get like little Jack Corn in the corner pulling out a plum and saying, oh, what a good boy am I. But there's another person here. But the tax collector, Jesus said, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, Jesus said, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. There's lots of prayers in the Bible. The Lord's Prayer, Paul has beautiful prayers. But really, this is probably the best prayer to memorize. Because this man went to his house justified. I've memorized it from another translation, just, God have mercy on me, a sinner. 
That's a great prayer. And it's interesting because he doesn't say anything about the blood of Christ, though the blood of Christ is certainly essential for God to forgive him. But he just understands his condition before the Lord. He says, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I would imagine just about anybody could say that prayer. Because Paul's already told us in chapter 1 that everybody knows there's a God. And everybody knows that God has rules to live by. And when we don't live by them, we mistreat ourselves and other people, right? Nobody likes to be around somebody who's ignoring God's law. Nobody likes to be lied to or abused or used in any way. And yet, this is what we do. So this is a very genuine prayer. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And the other prayer of the Pharisee, that's a horrible prayer. It's, so all the, people, all the people that Paul was talking about last week, Paul wasn't speaking about them with contempt. He was speaking about them in their loss, that they need to, be, they need to hear the gospel news, that Jesus loves them and died for them and made a way so that God could show them mercy. So this second person, this, this person, this Pharisee is really the person who now, after talking about people who live unrighteously, now Paul sets his sight on this Pharisee type person that we've all been, that we want to be careful not to be. And that's what this whole chapter two is really digging in and making clear. So he says right off, and he's addressing Christians, and many of them are Jewish. And he says, you therefore have no excuse. Now, he's just been talking about all kinds of lawlessness. And then he talks to the people who are lawful. And he says, you therefore have no excuse. You pass judgment on someone else. For whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself. Because you who pass judgment do the same things. And this is true of all of us. The minute we judge somebody for some kind of sin, something in that category we do. Because why? Because none of us is perfect. We all have this residual sin nature that, we're, that the Holy Spirit is working out of us. But because of that, we ought to be awfully humble and be willing to say almost every, well, probably every day, have mercy on me, a sinner. Now, we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based in truth. We know when we blow it, we deserve it. We don't want to change the rules. We want us to change. So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? This whole standard of Romans 1 and Romans 2 is about God's judgment. It's not so much about God's mercy. I don't think there's anyone in this room that wants to be judged on our works. When we think about it, even just to contemplate, we say, have mercy. Or do, you, or do you show contempt for the riches of the kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? So when God shows us mercy, he does it so that we won't go back and sin anymore. And yet, we still have this residual nature, and Paul is going to deal with this later on in the book. We still have this residual sin nature that we do. (laughs) We do do it again. So when we accept his mercy, the one thing he's saying is, don't be judging other people. Be loving other people. And notice the world, the fallen world you live in. It's full of people who ignore God and live totally recklessly against his law, or people who believe in God but still can't keep his law. But because of your stubbornness, this what kind of preacher is this anyway? He's offending his whole crowd. What's he doing? But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will repay each person according to what they have done. Swallow hard, church. This is what we deserve. 
This is why we want to say that prayer. Have mercy on me, a sinner. But those, but for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil. So look, there's a just like there were some that would ignore the truth and act like there is not God, there's also those who reject the truth and follow evil and judge other people. There will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil. For the Jew first, then for the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good. First for the Jew, and then for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. This is shocking to the Jews. The Jews are used to being God's chosen people. Now, if they had read their book carefully, they would have seen, no, they're chosen to bring God's love and light to everyone. This is the message of Jonah, remember? Jonah was called to the Ninevites. To an Old Testament Jew, the Ninevites were like the Nazis. They filleted their leaders and posted them on walls. Can you believe it? So when Jonah was called to love the Ninevites or or preach to the Ninevites, remember, Jonah went the other way. He got caught up with the whole fish thing, and finally God redirects him. But when he does preach to the Ninevites, he's hoping they won't listen. But he comes to them after being in a whale for three days. He's probably got no hair on his body. I kind of know what that's like these days. But uh, he comes to them, and they shock you. I mean, he's just a shocking figure, all bleached out. And all of Nineveh, Nineveh turns and repents. And this makes Jonah really, really upset. He goes on the hill hoping God's going to judge them with fire and burn them all up. And, and God has to speak to him and say, don't you realize I got all these people, they don't know their right from their left? Shouldn't I love them? They're made in the image of God. Don't we want to give them a chance to repent? That's the lesson of Jonah, that the Jews were called to bring God's love and truth to the whole world. And uh, this is really manifested in the gospel, the good news that Paul is presenting But for those who, sell, who are self-seeking, hmm, who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil. Boy, we want to be calling out. And then he makes this moral equival- equivalency between the Jew and the Gentile, and he says God does not show favoritism. Now, there are implications here that are controversial, but I want to address them in a minute. What does this mean for the many people who never hear the gospel of Jesus? They know there's a God, they know there's a law, and they know that they've broken that law. What are they going to do about that? Is there anything they can do? We're going to talk about that in just a minute, but let's keep on in Romans. All who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. That means all the Gentiles. They don't have the law of Moses. All who sin under the law will be judged by the law. Yikes, that's even worse. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but those who obey the law who are declared righteous. Now, this next part that's in bold, but it's also in parentheses, this is a really important part of Scripture in all of West, Western civilization in Christendom. You ever hear of natural law? This is where the concept of natural law comes. It comes right out of the Bible, right here. And it's saying, look, everybody, everywhere knows the natural law, and they're expected to obey it. Everybody, everywhere knows that it's wrong to lie to the people you love. Everybody, everywhere knows that uh, unjustified murder is a sin against God. Everybody knows these things. Why? Because God's placed it in their hearts. And and this doctrine is really important uh, for Western law especially. Indeed, he writes, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves even though they do not have the law. This is a big argument today. Atheists today really have a problem with saying that there's any evil in the world. Because if there's any evil, there's got to be good. And if, you're, if you don't believe in God, where does your moral compass come from? 
It's just whatever your preference is. You see the problem? Unless there's a standard of God's law, then you really can't say that anything is evil. People following this? That's the problem that the atheist has. He knows there's a right and wrong, but he has no explanation where it came from. And some might say, well, we've evolved this over time. Well, great, we could evolve something different in the future. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts sometimes excusing them and at other times even defending them. This will take place on the day when God judges people's secrets through Jesus Christ, as my gospel declares. So all of us kind of figure like Hitler and Stalin, they've got a good hot hell coming, and we'd want to even torch it up a little bit that they would get theirs. But he's saying, be careful, because all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And he's saying, you're not going to be judged by whether or not you were better than Stalin or better than Hitler. You're going to be judged by your own thoughts according to Jesus Christ. And Jesus is one who says, be perfect like your heavenly Father is perfect. So it would be hard for me to be judged by my words and my actions, but to be judged by my thoughts? Yikes. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Now, if you call yourself a Jew, so there was a real problem in this first first church in that the Jews were kind of like people that have been in church their whole life. And they looked at the outsiders who don't know when to stand up or genuflect or whatever else you're supposed to do here, right? They would look down their noses. We have the law. You don't have the law. You got Christianity, but we'll see how that goes. So he says, now, if you call yourself a Jew, you see how he's talking to that Pharisee in the parable Jesus said? Now, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and boast in God, if you know this is, if you know his will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor to the foolish, a teacher of little children, because you are in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. You then, who teach others, do not teach yourself. Who told on us? (laughs) How does Paul know this? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? That's kind of like a sin against other people. You who say people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? That's kind of like a sin against your own body, Paul tells us. You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You know, there was a lot of commerce that went on. And uh, the Jews sometimes would participate in that. You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? This is a sin against God. As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. What kind of reputation? You ever hear, I've talked to people who say, I would never hire a Christian again. That's the saddest thing. When we leave a job, we should leave that job with the person saying, boy, I'd love to find another Christian I could hire because he's going to be fair and he's going to work hard and he's not going to take advantage God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. We can contemporize this. God's name is blasphemed among the non-Christians because of us. When we exalt ourselves. But if we humble ourselves, we'll be exalted. Circumcision has value if you observe the law. But if you break the law, you have become as though you had not been circumcised. Don't take such pride in your outward circumstance. So then, if those who are not circumcised keep God's laws, God's keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? I kind of butchered that, so I'll try it again. So then, if those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, why? Because they're written on their hearts. Will they not be regarded 
as those as though they were circumcised? Hmm. So there's an equivalency here between Jews before Jesus and Gentiles before Jesus. The one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you who, even though you have the written code and circumcision, are a lawbreaker. A person is not a Jew who is one only outwardly, nor is circumcision merely an outward, outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart. Moses said, circumcise your hearts by the Spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. So when we accept God's mercy and then we judge other people and we think we're better than they are, then we've missed the point and we're not walking with the Lord because when the Lord sees other people, his heart breaks and he wants them to be in the house of God. He wants them to hear the gospel message that he's given to us. Last week I talked about Ron Greer and I want to mention him again today. Ron Greer was uh, a friend of the late Chuck Colson, and he speaks of Ron Greer. And when Chuck Colson first met him, remember he was in a prison and he was completely racist, hated all white people. The gospel came to him, and he stopped showing favoritism. And he was transformed and became a, a pastor in the prison. And when he was set free, he became a fireman, really to put his life on the line, and a pastor at the same time. But as a fireman, he was concerned about people's souls, and so he handed out tracts, and the tracts happened to mention that homosexuality is a sin. We need to love people who sin. But the tracts were not warmly received, and he lost his job at the fire department. And I think he was in Wisconsin, and he had a little church. His church in Wisconsin was then visited the following week by the local ACT UP homosexual group. And they came down his church cursing, swearing, and throwing condoms at the altar. But Ron Greer loved on him. And he warmly said, I want to hear you. Why don't you sit down and participate in the service? You're welcome to join us. After that, I guess they must have quieted down, but after that, a local newspaper man came to him and said, how could you stay so cool? How could you not be angry? And Ron Greer answered. He smiled and said, I have no more reason to be angry with them than I would with a blind man who stepped on my foot. That's the heart we need to have. This is not, you know, the idea that homosexuality is not a stretch, if you remember last week. Paul's saying, look, that's what happens when you worship idols. That's the judgment that we get. But what should our attitude be? Our attitude should be one of love, accommodation, and sharing the gospel. You know, we read the story of Jesus and we say, I don't want to be that guy. I hear the story of Ron Greer and I go, I want to be that guy. That's what I want to be. So now I want to think about what this means. All these people who never have heard the gospel of Jesus. I don't think Paul here is saying that every Jew before Jesus came is in hell. And I don't think then there's a moral equivalent that he's saying, Every Gentile before Jesus came is in hell. And this is a controversial idea. But I want to explore it today. And some people might be upset, but just be gentle because the cancer thing. (laughs) John R. R. W. Stott, who some of you probably know very well, he was an Anglican priest, and he was one of the worldwide leaders of the evangelical movement. He said, I have never been able to conjure up, as some great evangelical missionaries have, the appalling vision of millions who, have not, who are not only perishing, but who will inevitably perish. On the other hand, as I have said, I cannot be a universalist. Between these extremes, I cherish the hope that the majority of the human race will be saved. And I have solid biblical, a solid biblical basis for this belief. So let me show you what he's talking about. 
There's three views about people who could never hear the gospel. And one is the universalism. And the universalist says, you know what? It's all going to work out. God is love. He loves everybody. There's no such thing as hell. After you die, he's going to work it out. Everyone will eventually be saved. Now, that's kind of a hard stretch if you open your Bible and you read it literally and you go, Jesus talks a lot about hell. The restrictionism view is the most, this is the majority view. This is what I was taught as a kid, and this is what causes some of us to lose sleep at night. But it says general revelation, that is the creation. Remember last week uh, when we read Romans 1, he said, the creation makes God known. We see the complexity of this, and we know that uh, there is a God. Well, this view says general revelation is not sufficient for salvation. This is a big deal. This, this impassions many missionaries to take the Bible where it's never been before. That's a good thing. And they also believe special revelation, that is the Bible. So theologians talk about general revelation. That's all of creation, everything we see around us and what we are. And special revelation, that's the Bible, where God spoke to people and they wrote it down. And they say special revelation is necessary for salvation, that you can't be saved without it. Then there's another view, and this is the minority view. So if you disagree with this view, you're in the majority, you're okay. But this view is that general revelation is sufficient for salvation, that some way they were even excused, that if you say there's a God, he has a moral law, I've broken that moral law, and you cry out, God, have mercy on me, a sinner, you might not have to know all the details of the cross. Now, that salvation, that mercy is only available because of what Jesus did on the cross. If there were any other way, he would have said, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. He says, if there's any other way that I don't take this cup. And so this view that says that special revelation is beneficial for salvation. The more you can know about Jesus and the cross, the better off you are, and the more likely you are to receive it. It's good news. John puts it this way. There was a true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. Jesus is the light that enlightens every man. Now, some people are concerned that this is a new belief, but it's actually a very old belief. Now, this is not going to be a balanced view, by the way. Let me go back. So, this is not going to be a balanced view. Like I said, just be patient with me. But universalism, I don't recommend it. Restrictionism, I see why some people believe in it, but it sure breaks my heart to think that God has so many people. I think a lot of people, when they, it seems awfully hard to bring the gospel to an aboriginal group of people and say, the good news is Jesus died for you. The bad news is all your ancestors that you thought went to the great spirit, they're burning in hell. Now, if that's true, that's what we've got to say. But if that's not really what the Bible says, or if the Bible says it doesn't clear, say that clearly, I don't think that's a burden I want to carry. So what's the Bible say? Uh, this is not a new idea. Augustine of, Ho of Hippo, so this is about 400 AD, was the first to argue this low view of natural revelation. The early church fathers who predate Augustine, such as Irenaeus, Justin Martyr, Clement, Origen, Theophilus of Antioch, and Athen what is this? Athenagoras, uh, regarded general revelation as a reliable witness sufficient for salvation. And here's an example. Here's what Justin Martyr wrote in one little, probably in the second century. We have been taught, so he was taught by the founders, by, by uh, people who were followers of Paul anyway. We have been taught that Christ was the first begotten of God and the word of whom all mankind have a share. And those who lived according to reason are Christians, even though they were classified as atheists. So he's talking about the ancient Greek philosophers. And, you know, Socrates was considered an atheist. Why? Because he didn't believe in all the gods, but he believed in one God. There's an interesting book by a, by a uh, lawyer who goes back 
in all these ancient texts, and he says that most, really all the ancient cultures, started with a law with one God. This is the opposite of what we've been taught in school. We're taught in school that they are polytheistic and then they eventually they come to one God. But he goes into the ancient texts and he shows, no, they really started. So this would be like right after the flood. They believed in one God and the law that they would enact was always represented as what God's law is. When they get into idolatry and, and all that uh, polytheism, that's when the law gets really wild, which was just described for us in Romans 1 last week. So he says, for example, among Greeks, Socrates and Heraclitus, who was a little bit before Socrates, he said, these people were men of reason, they believed in one God, and they prayed to him. And we believe that they're to be with us in heaven. Psalm 51 puts it this way. Psalm 51 is an amazing psalm. After David had done such a terrible thing, <laughs> as committed murder and adultery, this man after God's own heart was convicted by the prophet who came to him, but he writes this in Psalm 51. It's a beautiful psalm. And he says to God, for you, God, do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offerings. So he's saying, all the sacrifices that you got through Moses, you gave us through Moses, those are great, but when I've really messed up, I just got to cry out, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. That's a pretty general statement. Here's how, uh, I'm just going to give some examples and then close this sermon off, but hopefully it's gives something everybody can think about. This is J.I. Packer. He has a Calvinist tradition, and uh, he's a Canadian. I didn't know that. Hold that against him. <laughs> but J.I. he wrote, Knowing God is probably pretty well known in this room. We can safely say, one, if any good pagan reached the point of throwing himself on his maker's mercy for pardon, it was grace that brought him there. Two, God will surely save anyone he brings thus far. And three, anyone thus saved would learn in the next world that he was saved through Christ. Just as David didn't understand all the specifics of the cross, it's just like I still don't understand exactly how the cross works. Why couldn't God just use a magic wand? But there's something beautiful in with his own blood, God saves us. Hebrews 11.6, as was read today, and it's interesting that uh, Derek observed that this is about, this is slipped in between Enoch, who wasn't a Jew, and Noah, who wasn't a Jew, and in fact, all the nations are descendants of Noah. And so the writer of Hebrews, who's likely Paul, says, and without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists. That's one. And that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. C.S. Lewis notes, we do know that no person can be saved except through Christ. If Christ didn't die on the cross, Abraham wouldn't have been saved. Isaac wouldn't have been saved. We do not know that only those who know him can be saved by him. Enoch, Noah, couldn't have been saved if it weren't for Jesus on the cross. Just a couple more of these. J.N.D. Anderson was an English lawyer, missionary. He was actually quite an expert lawyer in uh, Arabic studies. So he says, what of the mature persons who have sinned consciously but have never heard and therefore in no position to accept with explicit faith the gospel of God's matchless love for the whole world? May it not be that God, our Savior, who wants all men to be saved, 1 Timothy 2.4, and does not want any to perish, 2 Timothy 3.9, quickens in some men by his Spirit a consciousness of sin and need and enables them in the twilight to cast themselves on his mercy. If so, then they too will be saved by the grace of God in Christ alone. And this is the last quote, and this is a very controversial quote. Uh, Billy Graham got feedback on this quote to the day he died, actually. And he said, and that's what God is doing today. He's calling people out of the world 
for his name, whether they come from the Muslim world or the Buddhist world or the Christian world or the non-believing world. They are members of one body of Christ because they have been called by God. They may not even know the name of Jesus, but they know in their hearts that they need something that they don't have. And they turn to the only light that they have, and I think that they are saved and that they're going to be with us in heaven. Now, I will say that Billy Graham says more here than I would agree to. I don't think we're saved. I don't think anybody's saved by being a good Muslim. I don't think anybody's saved by being a good Buddhist. I don't think anybody's saved by being a good Presbyterian or Baptist or Christian or Mormon. But we're saved in spite of our beliefs. We're saved in spite of our bad theology and our incomplete knowledge. And we're saved when we turn to him and say, have mercy on me, a sinner. This is the prayer that Jesus said justified the tax collector. We've been committed to, that the Christian is called to defend the truth and overcome evil with good. Maybe you went through this with me and you said, boy, pastor, you missed it today. Swing and a miss. Well, let his grace would abound. I know when I get to heaven, he's going to correct my theology. Maybe he'll correct me on this. Maybe he'll correct someone else about this. But uh, let's have a heart. Let's have a heart for those who don't know the gospel. Let's realize how great and good this gospel is. Let us cling to it every day, not lifting ourselves up because of our own righteousness, but crying out to him for the mercy that we might be rewarded for our works. I think we're rewarded for our works. This is how I understand it. It might not be right. I think we're rewarded for our works, but we receive mercy for our failures if we ask, if we call, if we repent. Let's pray. Father, this is complicated, heavy stuff, and I knew this would be kind of a lot of reading in the sermon. I thank you for the patience of these people that you've called to be here. I pray that uh, where I am in error, you'll make it right, Lord, that you will give people wisdom and discernment. And Lord, I also pray that, uh, that at least even people who disagree with me will see that there are Christians who sincerely want to follow the Word of God to take this other view. And they do it with a sincere heart. And Lord, we pray that as we think about these things, we would have your heart and your spirit for the lost. That the best thing they could receive is the gospel message, that it would be crystal clear. And that they could understand that the mercy that you've given to us is only possible because of Christ's death on the cross. And let us not hold that with contempt by, uh, by thinking we're anything great or by judging other people, Lord. Let us not hold that in contempt and ignore the kindness and the righteousness of God that ought to lead us to repentance. And thank you, Lord, that you bring us all in this process that as we add to our faith and we make every effort, we're being shaped and conformed more and more into the image of your Son that we might be fruitful and productive in our knowledge of Jesus Christ for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.